Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to BFW 2401, uh, week 11, part three. Now, this is the core part, and we are calculating the capital adequacy ratio in this part according to the basal uh, tables, so which we call it the standardized approach. Now, in uh, part four, we will talk about the internal model, but our main focus actually in this class is in the standardized approach. Uh, uh, approach which is coming through the tables of the Basel Committee. Now, if you allow me, I will just um, uh, share my screen and start. Uh, this is around 31 slides, and therefore we will uh, we will try to see um, how can we go over this. Um, hopefully, it will not take a long time. So this is. Uh, uh, this is actually, as I said, part three, and we are concerned about the capital adequacy uh, calculation, which means the ratio, which is the core capital adequacy ratio. We call it CAR. Now, um, this blue font is actually what we are going to talk about. Um, we will talk here about the capital adequacy until this part. Now, in Baylor 2 and Baylor 3, we'll talk about it in the fourth part, but this one still, um, our main concern is only this one, and it's a lot of work, actually. Uh, so um, let's first uh, identify the risk-based capital ratio. Uh, it's the regulatory capital requirement described in this chapter are those under Basel 3, uh, they are effective in Australia uh, in, from January 1st, 2013, same thing in Malaysia. Um, and it incorporates the development from Basel 1 to Basel 3. So what, but actually we are not concerned about Basel 1, we are not concerned about Basel 2, we are concerned only Basel 3, which is under uh, um, effective now um, in Malaysia, Australia, and so many countries. Um, the period to um, uh, to apply this this requirement has given has given by Basel from 2013 to 2019. So most countries actually have the fall of this, as I will show you in the timeline. So the risk uh, we will start uh, to talk about the uh, as we are going to talk only about the car which is capital adequacy ratio, we have the numerator and the denominator. That's all. If we can get the right number in the numerator and denominator, uh, this is uh, what we are going to calculate. So this is actually the ratios. Now, unless, uh, unlike the leverage ratio, which is one ratio, which means capital over total asset, here we have different things. We have um, three types of capitals. We have the tier one, and this has to be 7% equal or more than 7%. And we have the tier one. So we have common equity tier one, and then we have the tier one. And they will tell you what is tier one and what is common equity and what is the total capital according to Basel tables. And then in the denominator, we have to have the equivalent asset, which is the risk weighted assets. When we say equivalent asset, we actually mean risk weighted assets for credit risk, market risk, operational risk, uh, non-traded interest rate risk. And all of those actually are the, uh, are the ones that we need to calculate. All of those risk-weighted assets for credit, market, operation, and uh, uh, securitization, and uh, non-interest risk in the banking book. Same nominator, same nominator, same thing for all of those. If you look at this or this or this, it's the same thing. However, only the capital here is tier one. And here is total capital. And here is the common equity. This has to be, when we calculate it, it should be more than 7%. Should be equal or more than 8.5, and this should equal 10.5%. So, in our examples or in our tests, whatever, I may ask you for those three ones, and you have to get 
uh, to see whether the bank satisfying Basel or not satisfying, you have to bring the common equity and see whether satisfying or no, the tier one and the total capital. It depends on the question, but usually I will ask about the three of them. And usually of the common equity is satisfying, the rest are actually satisfying. Now, uh, as you can see, if we are going to talk about this formula, this is the whole thing you are going to do. We need to identify which one is this one. We need to work first with the denominator and then work with the denominator one by one. Let's start with the denominator, which is the equity. Now, the, the regulatory capital. Now, the regulatory capital, as I told you, one, two, three. So we have the uh, common equity and we have tier one and we have the total capital. Remember, tier one, common equity tier one is part of tier one, but it's not all of it, but it's the most important uh, uh, capital in, the, in tier one. Now, uh, I have talked about basic, basic timeline when we talk tier and we say it's from 2013 to 2019. Yes, it is from 2013 to 2019. And it is actually, this is the basic, this is the, what we call basal timeline. This is table, basal timeline. Now the basal timeline, you can see 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, and it will tell you, this is the common equity. This is the common equity. Uh, as you can see, this is the common equity tier one, and this is the tier one, and this is the total capital. This is the total capital. So actually we have uh, common equity from 2013 to 2014 to 2015, it was only 4.5. Remember now we are talking about 7% because in 2016 and uh, after that and onward, we increase what we call a buffer. And the buffer is 2.5%. Now the capital is becoming starting 2016, for minimum tier one, uh, common equity tier one is 7% from 2016. You don't have to worry about 2015, uh, 14, 13. We are talking about from here. So it's already 7% when we add the buffer. Now this buffer will be added to the common equity. It will be added also to um, uh, tier one. It will also be added to the total capital. So, um, Tier one, if you look at it, it was 6%, 6%, 6%, 6%, and here it becomes 8.5%, and we continue like 8.5%, 8, 8 2019, 20, 21, and we are continuing like this until basal four will come or whatever. But as far as we are um, up to date and the status quo, tier one, uh, common equity is 7%, tier one is 8.5%. Let's talk about the total capital. Total capital also was 8%, 8%, 8%. And then uh, this is the minimum. All of those is the minimum total capital. We cannot have less than that. So all of those actually minimums, minimum tier one, minimum, minimum uh, equity and minimum um, uh, total capital. It was up to here, 2016, I told you 8%. We add the buffer, it's becoming which is 2.5 the buffer, it becomes to 10.5, and now we have 10.5. As you can see here now, uh, when we talk about this, we are talking about things coming after 2016, which is the current one. So according to this table, yes, we should have at least 7%, at least 8.5%, and at least 10.5% for the total capital. Um, now, um, Having said that, let's go now to the capital. Now this table called looks scary. Oh, this is actually, if you can look at it now, you will say, I have to calculate all of those. Actually, I'll make it easier for you. And I don't think the, uh, the, the calculating the regular capital will be um, uh, hard, uh, hard for you because I will give you just, it's very clear. I will give you two or three items and it's non, as I will show it in the, you will don't have to use this table actually. So, but just for the sake of information, we have all of those type coming under common equity. All of those is common equity capital. And this is the rest of tier one. So all of this is tier one. 
And part of it is common equity, which is all these types. And part of it is additional tier one capital. And both of them are um, um, tier one. And then we can add tier two, according to Basel, and all those instruments and all those uh, type of assets, a top a type of capital called tier two. Now, somebody would say, where is the total capital? Tier one plus tier two equals the total capital. Um, Basel didn't mention total capital actually, but they mention, they mention it here in the, in the previous slides. But when we come to the breakdown of the capitals, we are talking about tier one and tier two, and tier one and tier two is actually the total capital. Okay, um, just for the sake of information again, if we want to know the, uh, the buffers, we have two type of buffers. One is already um, um, started 2016, which is this, what we call capital conservation buffer, which is 2.5%. And the size is common to all, and it is permanent, and applies to all uh, financial institutions. And um, uh, it is, um, according to Australia, it is actually required and um, unmentioned in one of these uh, uh, EPS, which is uh, Australian Prudential Standards, we call it uh, uh, EPS. So um, it's already disclosed, but, uh, and it's already common. Now we are talking about Australia, but you can apply it to Malaysia, to anywhere. It's already uh, uh, under effect and uh, we, everybody knows it. Um, I mean, the financial institutions and the regulators, and it's permanent. Now, we have another one, which is 2.5, but we don't apply it. And if we apply it, the capital, the minimum, the minimum total capital will go to 13%. And this will make, which make, you know, um, European banks especially crazy to hold 13% just as a capital. This one, we call it counter cycle buffer, but this one, only regulators have the right to ask the financial institutions to hold it during high volatility, high, you know, in those economic cycles where it's actually important to, uh, uh, you know, um, ask banks to, when there is too much risk in the market and the regulators are, you know, have concern about the safety and the stability of the financial system. Uh, so they will ask banks to, apply this counter cycle buffer when the volatility is gone and when things are calm down, uh, coming down and coming down. So in this case, uh, actually they will ask the financial institution to stop applying it. So as you can see, this is only based on the request of the, uh, finance, of, of, of the regulators if it is needed. And uh, we are not seeing it in any reporting until now. Um, so this is the two buffers, I, I want you to understand it uh, and to know it. This one is already permanent. This is only in periods of high credit growth only, okay? Um, and it has to be announced here by regulators. This is already in standard, which means it applies and it's common and it's an effect. This one is only when it is requested, as I said, uh, during those high volatility times. Then we are done down now in the capital, which means this part is done. We already know it and we know how to apply it, okay? And this is telling us which capital we can use. So you will take the item and you will add it. I will give you the common equity. You just, you know, from the balance sheet, how much is it? Common equity or all those, or one of those, which I will identify it for you. You put it in the denominator. Now your problem is, which actually not a problem, but it's much work, is the, um, uh, the denominator. Denominator is you have credit risk, market risk, operational risk, interest rate risk, and securitization risk. Remember, when we, talk, when we talk about all of those, we have to go one by one. Now, what I will do, the process in this lecture and on those slides, I will start with the credit risk. And then credit risk, we have two. We have on balance sheet, and we have the off balance sheet. And we have to use these tables. These tables will be given to you 
and they are five tables and they already uploaded for you and under week um, uh, 11. So we have table one um, and they will tell you how to use it. Table two, table three, table four. This also will be with you in the exam and table five without the test or the final exam if it comes. So you don't have to worry about memorizing anything. You just have to know how to apply those tables. Now, having said that, let me go back now and start calculating the on-balance sheet. This is only examples. Now, the on-balance sheet, this is actually um, coming from the rating agencies, which usually come under table five. So all we have to do, I will give you the asset and I will tell you the asset ranking is A or I will give you any ranking. And if you go to table five here, you have to just to take how much is the value of the assets and apply it. So as you can see here, we are using Standard & Poor's. Standard & Poor's, we are not using Moody's or Fitch. We are using Standard & Poor's and we will fix ourselves and uh, according to that. So we have 20% anything which is cash, cash equivalent claims on Australian government, which is all those government securities is zero weight, see? So if I have assets, I don't have risk on that as a credit risk, remember, as a credit risk. So it's zero. But if it is from travel A to A, which we call it one, I will not give you one, I will give you this. I will give you the rating of the rating agencies. So 20%. If it is from A to minus 50%, this 100%, this 100% B, and then if it is from B plus to B minus, it's 150 and the same thing applies to the Cs and the Ds, okay? So if I go back now to my, uh, you can see, when it is travel to travel A, it's 20%. This is all from table five. Just to let you know, this is, uh, this is almost from table five. You don't have to worry about things. And it is actually from Belarus. Actually, this is coming from Basel two, but it's already now we are talking about Basel uh, three, which is uh, you know just um, uh, carrying all uh, um, proceeding from table two uh, from from uh, uh, Basel two. You don't have to worry about it. This is actually what is applied for Basel three now currently. Okay, so now we have. So what is our assets? which we talk when we talk about, look, we are talking about banking book. In the banking book, what we have, either housing loans or business loans. Now, the housing loans is this one, the, the business loans and all other businesses is coming under this. What if it is housing loans? It's different. So you will see LBR, this is what you call L, loan to valuation ratio, which you call it LBR. So LVR, when I give you the loan, and the loan is from zero to 60% of the price of the house, or it can be from 60% to 80%, or from 80 to 90, 90 to 100. In Malaysia, we are giving this. Now, those, they have standards contracts for the mortgages. Now, some of them are insured, some of them are not insured. And we have non-standard uh, mortgages. Actually, we are not using this one. So you can actually um, ignore this one. We are using usually in this class, at least we are using the, the um, uh, standard, the standard, uh, standard eligible mortgages, which is standard contracts. Now, uh, this is the risk weight. Uh, this is the risk weight when there is no insurance because some of them have insurance, some of them have in not insurance. And I will tell you, I will tell you the LBR is 80%, for example, or 70% or 60%. And it is insured or not insured. All you have to go to come to take the weight, 35%, to, to take one of those weights. If it is insured, then I will give you all those, those weights. So you have to use this table. As I told you, actually, we are not using the standard. We are using this one. So now let me take an example. So assuming this is just to give you an example for a credit risk, how you cal calculate the risk weighted asset for credit risk uh, on balance sheet. So if I have notes and coins, which means cash 10 million, 
for this bank. And we have loans, this is from the balance sheet, loans to international with a credit rating of C, Travel B. Now you already know Travel B, from now, you know, it's, it's 20 million, but they are not going to take the 20 million. You are going to take the risk weighted asset of this 20 million. Same thing for the resi uh, uh, residential mortgage loans, LVR 80%. And no mortgage insurance, and this the amount is 70 million, which means for sure you are talking about this area. The 35 percent, 80 percent mortgage, 35 percent. If you are going to talk about this, the this travel B, you will go to table five, as I told you, and table five, travel B, where is it? It's this one, which is 100 percent. You can see. So now I go back, um, loan to international crop rates with a credit of double A, this is from table five, loan to crop rates with a credit rating of B minus 50 million. So the total assets 200 million. I am not going to take risk weighted assets of 200 million, but I will calculate it according to Basel. And this is what I did. So for the cash zero, according to table five, for the, um, uh, the first loans, this one, the uh, international with credit of AAA, this is, I'm going to take it of 20%. Travel B is, or travel B of 10%. So it's 100% times 20. Yeah, so this is travel B times 20, 100% times 20, which is the dollars, the value. And this is the housing, 55% times 70. And this is the, uh, uh, this loan, which is the international 50 million. This is 20% from table five. This is travel A, as you can travel A is 50%. Uh, twenty percent times fifty, so this is actually a travel A. This is a travel A, and the travel A, as I told you, according to the table, it's twenty percent. Yes, so uh, it's very clear now that we are using the same uh, uh, the rating from table five, and then we have loans to uh, uh, to crop rates with credit of B minus of fifty. Uh, this is. Uh, uh, this is actually 150% according to table five. You add it, it's 129 million. And instead of the 200 million, now the risk weighted asset for this 200 million asset is 129. So the financial decision need to hold capital at a minimum of 129, just for this one, for the credit set time 10.5, which is 13.60 million. This is just to satisfy the total capital. Now you can talk about uh, common equity, and you can uh, multiply this only by 7%. You can talk about um, uh, um, tier one, and you multiply this by 8.5%, uh, 8 but 8.50%. Uh, but, um, but now we are talking actually as total capital. So this is how we are doing it for uh, on balance sheet. It's very straightforward. Now let's move to the next step, which is now talking about the off balance sheet. Off balance sheet is a little bit actually not complicated, but it has to go 
through two steps. The first steps, you have to use table three and four to get the equivalent. And then after the equivalent, you have to see the rating of the inter uh, counterparty and you multiply it by the, um, uh, by the credit uh, weights in table five. So here you have to use table three and four. And here you have to use, of course, table five, which is table five. Now, remember, this is off balance sheet. And off balance sheet, we already talked about it in week 10. And if you remember, we keep stressing the issue of non market related and market related. This is the non market related. Um, look at um, Look at now to the to this example. So there are the following of balance sheets: 80 million two-year loan commitment. I understand this is a loan commitment. It's off balance sheet, and it's non-market related. Okay. Um, so this is the rating, and it's 80 million. But I need to convert this first to how much this loan commitment will be in terms of capital if it is crystallized. What is my risk on that? And then I need to multiply it by the rating of the counterparty, which means I have the contract with. Same thing applied to 10 million of uh, direct credit uh, substitutes, standby letter of credit. The counterparty is travel B. And then we have 50 million non-traded uh, uh, related uh, issue, uh, uh, what we call um, trade uh, related letters of credit. And we have talked about this when we talked about in week 10 on the uh, 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 non-market related. This is the OPS, all of them are of balance sheet. Now, in order to do this, we have first to bring the 80 million We have to bring the 80 million, the 10 million, the 50 million. And then I did 80 million, 10 million, and 50 million. Then I have to go to get the conversion factor, which is now I have to go to table three and four. To look, for example, for this item, it's two year commitment. So I have to go to if the tables, this is commitments, which is item number 10. And commitments, it's long commitments. And we have one year or less, we have over one year. And this is for the standby letter, uh, uh, what we call uh, standby facilities. So if it is over one year, we will use 50% less than one year, 20%. What about ours? Ours is actually two years. So for sure, I take the 50%. Now, standby letter of credit, standby letter of credit is actually coming in item one in table three, which is this one. You have to have the tables in front of you. So this is the standby letter of credit. You can see here, it's the standby letter of credit. It's over here, standby letter of credit, and it is 100%. So when I go here, I multiply by 100%. Then we have trade related, which is item three. We will discuss this in the tutorial in details. And if you see a table three trade related contingencies, which is 20%, I did the 20% and then I move and you can see it's 20%. So now I get the credit equivalent, which is step one. So I get 40, 10, 10. Now, I have to bring this 40 in the second step, 40, 10, 10. So this is the first step. And this is the second step now. And I have to multiply it by the risk weights. So I understand now it's very straightforward because the risk weights for this is travel B, for this is B plus, and this is uh, uh, travel B minus. And this is travel B. So all I have to go and see from the table five. So if I go to, uh, uh, yeah, 
here actually it's saying table four and this and this and this um, um, uh, according to the sequence of the tables here but here actually we are, we can use this is table four actually you can see I was it is table four but uh, in the tables that you will use always we call it table five but anyway it's it's the um, uh, for the risk weights so I will go I will keep using just those tables. So on table five, this is the tables that will be given to you in the exam. So now, so this is um, um, travel B, it's 150% and sun by letter of credit is 100%. And as I told you, trade related, this is, you have to take the risk weight according to the rating of the counter by T. And you can take it from, as I told you, table five in the main tables or table four here, according to this tables. But I prefer you use my tables here, um, regardless whether it's table five or table four, you are using the, the, the rating and you are using the standard and poor's and this is the risk weights. Okay, so when I calculate now this one, I get actually the credit equivalent 60, 100. And so this is the risk weighted asset for credit risk for off balance sheet credit risk. So as you can see, now I am trying to build the formula. I already finished the denominator and first the, finished the first item in the denominator, which is the credit risk. What is left? I will go to the operational risk. Now the operational risk is much easier and straightforward. And Basil and also the Australian have provided us with this formula. And this formula will be given to you. So when you calculate it, you have to divide the business because operation and risk is what? Is the efficiency and the risk coming from the systems or the people. So to do that, you have, they already provide us with a formula. So I have to take all the risks for retail banking or the, or the uh, total gross outstanding loans for retail banking, gross outstanding loans for commercial banking, which is very easy to do. This is for the businesses. This is for the uh, retail banking, which is a personal uh, lending. And this is the gross income from any other sources, okay? And then you have to, You have to take it for six months. As you can see, this will be given. This will be given. So you have to take point, this is 12% for the retail banking, 15%. You have to use it for all banks, the same thing, 15% for commercial banking and 18% for retail banking. But you cannot use one period. You have to take six periods of uh, semi-annual. So to, to follow this, you have to bring all this data for three years and six months, okay? Uh, for three years, which is actually six periods. So uh, six periods, which means every year, two periods for three years is six periods and you get the average. So uh, this is M and the M is 3.5. And then this is the values of the, um, of the retail banking, this is the values for commercial banking, and this is the values for other businesses. Let's look at this example. So as you can see, this is the retail banking. This is the loan for retail banking for uh, first half of year one, second half of year one, first half of year two, second half of year two, first half of year three, and second half of year three. As you can see, this is six periods, and this is the values. And this is the values for commercial banking. And this is the values for all other activities. All I have to do now, the 12, the 15, the 18, we know that. This is given 3.5, 3.5. And then you have to add those ones. The values for, which is this one actually. You put it here. Same thing you do for the um, uh, commercial banking. 
Now, for the other businesses, you have to multiply 18, and then you don't have to multiply by this 3.5. You just bring all those assets and you divide by three. This formula will be given to you, and you have calculated what now? You have calculated the capital. Now, I will introduce you in this moment, in this stage, to another issue called capital charge. Now, the capital charge, I get the capital, but I don't need the capital. I already calculated the capital. This is the capital needed to buffer this operational risk. I want to cover it, to transfer it to assets. So if I use this formula, for example, if I use this formula, let me just, uh, if I calculate the total assets, if I calculate the total assets, let me just write it here maybe. Just if one dollar of capital over total assets, over total assets equals 10.5%. We understand that. Now, if I want to calculate the total assets, given the capital, the total assets now actually equals 9.5 times the capital. This is from this formula. And this is why we have to add all of those and multiply them. And I did <clears throat> multiply them by 9.52. Why? To get the risk weighted assets for operational risk. I'm not interested in the capital. This is what we call the capital charge. And this is applies also when we come and calculate the market, um, um, the market risk. Um, we cannot calculate the assets directly as we did in the credit risk, but we calculate the capital charge, the losses, which means the capital charge. This is the losses that can happen, which means this is how much capital uh, I should have. I don't need the capital because I already know what, what is my capital. I want to transfer this to assets. And this is what I did. I did, I played, I multiplied by 9.52. And this is the end of operational risk. Now, let me go to uh, uh, the uh, market risk. Now, the market risk is, is a big issue, actually. Uh, uh, we have two different approaches. We call the sunrise model, predetermined by regulators, predetermined by regulators, and we have to use tables or what we call the internal market risk, which we will discuss it in uh, part four um, after we finish this one, uh, after we finish part three. Now, please understand that what we are calculating here is the sunrise model. Now, when we talk about market risk, we are talking about what? We are talking about the trading and the trading is the banking book. And if you remember, you go back now to week nine when we talked about the deer and the bar, those ones we have, um, uh, we are trading fixed income securities. We are trading equities. We are trading um, foreign exchange um, commodity, uh, foreign exchange. Um, uh, uh, we have foreign exchange corporation, um, uh, you know, uh, foreign exchange uh, operations, or we call it, um, uh, you know, this uh, our business and trading of the currencies. And then we have, um, um, we can have derivatives. We can have. Uh, commodities, all of those. And in those ones, please remember, sometimes we go long and sometimes we go short. And when we say long, which means we buy the asset and we keep it for some time until the price goes up, we sell it. Or we can go short, which means we sell the asset now because the, its price is high and we wait until the price goes down and buy it. So either we are going short or long, we had different positions. There is a, a regulators are concerned about all those tradings and they want us to keep enough capital. 
Now, in week, um, uh, in week nine, when we talk about uh, the risk matrix and the DEER and the VAR, we know how much our risk. Now, the regulators say, okay, you know what is your risk? And they give us guidance, how to, uh, guides how to calculate the, um, the market risk. They want it to be transferred as capital. And this is what, this is the assets which is in our trading book. We have um, interest rate risk for the trading, and this is actually for the fixed income. We have equity positions, we have exchange rate risk, we have commodities, we have derivatives. Let me show you how do they do it in the traded interest rate risk. This is for the fixed income, if you remember, fixed income securities, which has, um, uh, They bring us with this table. So we have general market risk and we have a specific market risk. Specific market risk mean the risk that we have to the counterparty, but the general market risk is actually the risk which is related to the, to the market. So they come up with this issue, which is the, uh, you have to have uh, bands, which means if you remember the bands, it's like, the durations. So we have one month or less, one month at up to three months, three months up to six months, six months. And you have to, uh, this is for anything that have coupons over 3%. And that the coupons less than uh, 3% or duration method. So, uh, if you have, one month or less, and this is applies to over three months, uh, less than three, uh, three months, uh, three coupon of 3% of my assets or less. And this is for the less and this is the more, and this is the risk weights. So if it is one month, you don't take anything. Don't worry about this column because this column this is what the regulators assume that change would be. All I need now to take this uh, risk weighted assets. All I have to do now is to calculate this one. And so if it is uh, 20%, 40%, as you can see, according to the time bands, time bands, which is the um, time horizons of those investments. So I have to take my investments according to their maturity and uh, divide them here and calculate the risk weights. So I will take the position and multiply it by the, and multiply it, uh, and multiply it by the, uh, by the risk weights. This is for the market risk. Now, they also provide, because the, the risk, is, there must be some offsetting. Offsetting means there must be what we call the horizontal disallowances and vertical disallowances, which means you have now, for example, you, you, you have the positions because you have the positions of the long, which is the assets you are buying now and keeping for the future to sell it, or which is the asset side. And you have the liability side, which is your shorts, which means the assets you sold now and you want to buy in the future. And you are subject in those two issues. So you have to match the net longs and the net shorts and get the position. But when you do that, there will be, uh, there will be basis points because the interest rates will not move the same. And there is also a gap between the net short and the net long in each of those bands. Anyways, what they did is, I know it's headache, but it's, it's like this. So they provide what we call uh, horizontal uh, disallowances and uh, vertical uh, disallowances. And this is how they work it. Now, how to apply all of those? Let me take you to this example. So the, say the vertical allowances reflects basis risk and gap risk between the shorts and the longs, right? Um, as each time, what do we mean by uh, basis risk? Because the increase 
In the liability side, maybe not increasing in the asset side. Maybe there is some differences. So the regulators want you to take that to consideration. And also the difference between the risk, the long and the short. So you keep calculating those. Um, so assuming that you have a long and a time is 100 in any time band, and you have the, the risk weights of the short is 90. So, so the cold uh, vertical allowances uh, for that time band would be 10% of the 90, which is 10% of the 90, which is actually your shorts. Um, so the general market capital requirements and the maturity method, because they use the maturity method, can be summarized as the sum of, so if you have the net position here, whether it is short or long positions, you have it, for example, to, um, whatever value, which equals 100%. So if that value, you can have it, for example, 50, for example. And then you have to take 10% to arrange for the vertical allowances. They want you to match weight position in all maturity bands, which means you have to take 10% of this. Then you have to take 40% of this. And then you have to take for the batch weight position within this zone two, because we have zone one. Zone one is from one month to from zero to one month, one year. Zone two is from one year to three and four years. Zone three is from four, four years and then over 20 years. And then there is difference between, as I told you, for the net positions of the shorts and the longs, even with the zones. And they want you to take that to consideration when you calculate that in the market risk. Uh, so um, this is what we do. All we have to do is to get the position of the short and the long here and add the percentages it's already given from Basel. So if this is 100%, which is the 50, then you have to add all of those and add all of all of this uh, values and it's actually your exposure and your risk. This is for actually for the general market risk. It's very complicated. It's very complicated comparing to the others, but for you, in the exam, and this is what I used to do, is I will give you a value and I will tell you this is the, uh, I will save you all this calculation and I will tell you this is actually the capital charge for the market risk, the general market risk. All you have to multiply it by 10.5 and that's it. And you have to, uh, this is what I have done during all those old semesters. I will give you the capital charge you multiply it by 9.52, and this is the risk weighted assets. Now, um, when we talk about specific risk, um, it's uh, no problem. It's just the risk of the counterparty. This is the risk which is coming when we talk about general risk, is the changes in the market of the interest rate, the, uh, you know, all those issues, interest rate, exchange rate, things that will, volatility, that we don't actually have a control. And this is, as I told you, the way to calculate it. But for the um, specific risk, it's the, the market risk, which is the counterparty market risk, regardless of the, uh, of the credit risk. This is the market risk, the specific risk of our clients. So we just go and see, we take the position and we see the ranking, and this is actually the weights is the capital charge. You do this, this will give you a capital charge. You multiply it by 9.52 and you get the risk weighted assets. It's very easy. It's according to the rating. And this is the capital charge. This is also capital charge and you have to multiply it by 9.52. Um, so we are done with the, with the, with the um, uh, market risk. We can do market risk also for equity, position, exchange rate risk, commodities, please understand if you are going to work in the industry later on, they have to calculate all of this. We are not covering it here, but actually it is um, covered under ABS, which is Australian Prudential Standard 116 and 117. Now, um, we have 
we, then we move now from market risk because this is the rest of market risk. Now we move to risk capital charge for on balance sheet uh, uh, securitization credit risk. Now the securitization, if we have securitizations um, uh, and those securitization actually in our, um, like MBB, MBB means uh, mortgage backed uh, bonds, which is still in our uh, balance sheet. Now, um, this is all we have to do is to bring the dollar positions and multiply it if it is one, two, three, four, five and six. So one, two, three, four, five. If I tell you what is one, two, three, four, five, it's actually these numbers, which is coming from the table five. So one means the triple A, two means the A plus, and three means the BB and all those. So either you can, they didn't talk about the uh, rating, they just bring you the numbers. So this is how we, so one here is actually, this is the table five, the numbers is a table five, which is actually reflect the rating. So if it is a securitization risk weights, uh, you have to do it 20% uh, 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 for the, uh, this is for the long-term positions. And um, so as you can see, it's based on the rating. And this is the short term exposures. And the credit rating is uh, according to this. And we have actually um, securitization and resecretization. So sometimes we have the original assets and sometimes we set those assets and we make them another bond. So we have a bond backed by another bond. So this is what we call resecretization. If it's going to be there, then in this case, as you see, the risk is increasing. And it is, this is if you have uh, 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 resecretization. So this is the, um, uh, this is the, uh, the rates, it's very high. So um, this is when we have securitization, as I told you, and it is for the unbalanced on sheet securitization exposure. I am actually uh, done with this. Um, and this is the end of part three. Thank you very much, and I will see you. Uh, please don't worry a lot about this part, especially when it comes to market risk. I will give you just the uh, uh, what we call the capital charge and the multiply it by 9.52. We will talk about this in the tutorial. The other ones should be uh, straightforward. Thank you, and see you in part four. Thank you.